U.S. diplomats suffer brain injuries after sonic attacks in Cuba. Some U.S. and Canadian diplomats working in Havana have been diagnosed with traumatic brain injury, with likely damage to the central nervous system, after there were suspected attacks directed at their homes by what officials believe were a sonic weapon. It is possible that the device generated infrasound, which is below the range of human hearing. It travels great distances and can easily penetrate most buildings. Low-frequency infrasound can affect the vestibular system, while high-powered infrasound can cause more damage and result in symptoms such as nausea and pressure in the chest. Another type of sound outside the range of human hearing is ultrasound. High-frequency ultrasound can damage blood vessels in the ear canal. However, high-frequency sound dissipates quickly over distance, therefore the device must be close enough to its target in order to cause damage. A number of diplomats have ended their assignments in Cuba early because of the attacks. The U.S. State Department has not yet identified a definitive source of the attacks, nor has it found any devices capable of carrying out such an attack. U.S.-Cuban relations have been rocky for a while now. After 50 years, the U.S. and Cuba decide to normalize diplomatic relations. President Barack Obama, along with Cuban President Raul Castro, agreed to restore provisional diplomatic ties and ease trade restrictions, which both leaders broadcast to their audience earlier today. Okay, this is fine and dandy and all, but there are more than a few of you out there who probably don't know how Cuba got to be on America's X list in the first place. See, in the 1930s, Cuba was the richest Latin American country, but in addition to being America's island playground, there was a huge wealth gap that caused revolutionaries like Che Guevara and Fidel Castro to revolt and start a communist government. They signed a treaty with the Soviets for trade, protection, and arms. America didn't like that, so the CIA tried to invade in 1962, but failed. The Soviets then sent nukes to Cuba, and that almost caused World War III. Luckily, everyone backed down. The damage was done, though. America broke full ties with Cuba and placed trade sanctions on its ships and tourists dealing with Cuba. At first, Russia was its biggest trading partner, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, another country stepped in and filled the void. Can you guess who? The whole debate on whether to restore trade with Cuba has raged on for years. The embargo and prohibited travel has even ripped apart whole families and lives. Just ask any of the many residents of South Florida who have Cuban descent. Many U.S. presidents have attempted to normalize relations with Cuba, but it seems Obama had been talking in secret for months to get this deal to happen. He and Castro agreed to start releasing each other's political prisoners and former spies as soon as possible, meaning immediately, as a sign of good faith. Next, a framework will be laid to ease banking restrictions in order to help families in America send money back to Cuba, along with enabling businesses to invest and tourists to spend. This also means the reopening of embassies and consulates will be in the offing as well. It's reported that the Vatican and Canada also had a hand in brokering today's agreement. This won't be a cakewalk, though. First, Obama needs to get the deal past the majority GOP Congress that could stop any of this from happening anytime soon. And also, it's not like the U.S. is the only game in town. Many other countries have had open ties with Cuba for decades. There's also the question of what kind of leverage the U.S. can use to force Cuba to do the right thing once full ties are restored. Sure, Cuba will probably have a Starbucks on every corner afterwards, but please try to remember what got us here in the first place. U.S. government approves ferry services to Cuba. The United States has approved ferry services between Florida and Cuba for the first time in five decades. The U.S. Treasury and Commerce Departments gave approval on Tuesday to at least four companies to run ferry services between Florida and Cuba. Havana Ferry Partners plans to launch its ferry service between Key West and Havana, while Baja Ferries is looking into the possibility of launching services between Port Everglades, Port Manatee, and other Florida ports to Cuba. Airlines Brokers Company is considering Port Everglades, among other places. United Caribbean Lines Florida is looking at launching its ferry services to Cuba from Miami, Fort Lauderdale, the Tampa area, and Port Canaveral. Americans are not currently allowed to travel to Cuba for general tourism, except for visits that fall into 12 categories, including family visits, official government business, and humanitarian projects. 
Cuba developing a vaccine for lung cancer. America wants in. What's the first thing you think of when you see someone puffing on a stogie? Yup, Cubans, the finest cigars the world has to offer. But it may surprise you to find out Cuba is actually becoming known for its success in treating lung cancer. A new vaccine, Simovax, has been in development in Cuba for a quarter of a century. Simovax targets a growth factor in the body called EGF, which allows cancer to survive. By attacking EGF, the cancer starves and its growth slows, extending a patient's life for as long as an extra year and a half. Early studies with Simovax have shown minimal side effects like nausea, fever, and vomiting, but it's a small price to pay for less cancer. The drug's been used to treat 5,000 cases of lung cancer worldwide, but with FDA approval pending, testing could still be a ways away in America. After the U.S. made nights with Cuba in December 2014, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo went on a trade mission to Havana last year to get the ball rolling to bring the drug to America. Now, there's more hope than ever for the estimated 224,000 plus Americans living with lung cancer. Cuba is opening up even more to U.S. citizens. Formerly frosty relations between the United States and Cuba continue to thaw this week as our neighbors to the south begin accepting scheduled flights from U.S. airliners again. A JetBlue flight from Fort Lauderdale to Santa Clara on Wednesday was the first scheduled passenger flight between the U.S. and Cuba after 50 years. U.S. airlines are now allowed to fly to Havana and nine other Cuban airports, adding 300 new flights per week to the formerly hardline communist island state. Traveling by sea to Cuba is also an option. Cruise company Carnival goes from Miami every other week, stopping in Havana, Cienfuegos, and Santiago de Cuba. Uncle Sam still technically forbids U.S. citizens from traveling to Cuba solely for tourism. But in reality, no one's checking once you tick that box. American trips to Cuba must fall within one of 12 categories, which include visiting relatives, professional research, journalism, or religious activities. Organized or independent people-to-people -people tours are also permitted, so long as they include a full-time schedule of activities and meaningful interaction between the traveler and individuals in Cuba.